summarizes his principles, his philosophy, his life's mission, his hopes, and his faith in the strength, inevitable triumph, and reascendancy of African people. For those who never had the opportunity to meet or hear Dr. Bobby E. Wright, this presentation will serve as an introduction to the man and his mission. For those who were fortunate enough to have known Bobby, this will be an opportunity to remember, to be re-inspired, and to be rejuvenated by their old friend. Asante Sana, Abari Ghani, brothers and sisters, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You know, sitting and listening at the other two, two presentations always influences me to somewhat uh, modify my eyes, especially since we went through that two to the force of, uh, can you? We went through that two to the force uh, Jenny did of uh, mental health centers. My, my uh, position is the exact opposite of, of Jenny. I'm very unique, and I hate to be one of those who say I'm, a, I'm the only one, but I'm probably the only black in this country who is over an all-black comprehensive mental health center. There's only one we've been able to identify, and that's Garfield Park. Of the 750-some uh, centers that are in operations now that were designed in, in 1963 primarily for black people, only one in this country is an all-black center. Yet there are hundreds of all-white centers, all-white comprehensive centers. Not only is Garfield Park all black, the staff is black, and I'm in a, I'm in a community with 118,000 black people. We have approximately 96,000 face-to-face contacts per year, 96,000. So when I talk to you about behavior and all this coming out of some type of background, because the majority of our people in Garfield Park are from Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, and places like that have southern backgrounds in, in, in the city of Chicago. Also, by the mere fact that I, I'm also unique in another way in that I grew up in an all-black town not 100 miles from here. Uh, called Hopton City, Alabama, which my grandfather was one of the founders of, one of the oldest black towns uh, in this country. It doesn't have the reputation of a Mount Bayou because uh, one of the problems we had as we were growing up that we uh, always had a problem with was becoming known. Uh, we didn't want to become known, and for many years I've never wanted to become known. In fact, it's not well known, but up until, 19, up until about 1975, was the first time I ever consented to speak in front of a, a mixed group. In front of a mixed group. The tragedy, read, I'm telling you this because I'm going to talk to you as psychology students or behavior scientists, black, because there's only one fight left, just one, and that's for the fight for the black mind, and we are losing. We are losing. You see, because if you stop to think about it, some of the things I'm going to show you, and then we're going to give some solutions. Today I'm going to tell you some things that you will reject, but that we can do. And that, uh, and that we should be about doing it. They're very simple things, something you can do in your day-to-day -day life. The first thing you must recognize is as a black student, as a black student, you have uh, a responsibility that I just cannot tell you what it is. I mean, it is so awesome. But yet, you are no different than a Palestinian student. Students your age in Palestine are carrying guns and, and, uh, from uh, Palestinian students. Israeli students your age, Jew students your age are carrying guns in addition to going to school. Carrying guns. Boy, students who also had to go to school had to carry guns. All we're asking you to do is what? Go to school. <laughs> and you are carrying guns, but against the wrong people. You're carrying guns, unfortunately, but against each other. Now, that, 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 that becomes what, we, what I deal with is the difference between what we have. By going to the University of Chicago and being trained there, and as Harold said, it's a difference between education and training. It is impossible. And I will say this to you openly, it is impossible for the Georgia school system to educate black children, mm -hmm. but they can train you in those skills we need. Your education must come from the black community and from black people. There's a difference between education and training, and that's where I want to start this off with, because a lot of people get confused about that. In Alabama, with all black teachers, they not only, they taught me how to think. Not so much what and what to think, but basically how to think. They also taught me group behavior, not individualistic behavior. Now that is what training does. Training, training teaches you to operate against the best interests of your own group. It teaches you individual behavior rather than group behavior. Education is a liberating force, a liberating force. So I'm going to go through quickly some of the things on why you should learn the skills. And nothing I say, I hope, nothing I say will imply that we are not faced with a very shrewd 
very shrewd, uncompromising, dangerous enemy. Don't ever, don't ever take it in your mind that these white people are going to be easy to be had. It ain't going to be true. This is a hard fight because they have the institution and we have the people. You see, and as long as you control institutions, you can control the behavior of people. Now, with that, with that in mind, listen to, listen to it carefully. The first lesson, the very first lesson you must learn as students is that the most, the fundamental mistake you can make is to try to use white definitions to explain or analyze black phenomena. That's the first mistake you make. And any time you use their definitions that are given to you, you're in trouble. Now the second lesson, the second lesson I go against Harold here. I do not think you should tell your white professors nothing. I do not think you should argue with them. I don't think you should do anything. I think you should accept the skills they get and go about those. I know your black professors either. Your objective of being at Atlanta Junior College is to acquire skills and get out and go on to more houses there for more houses. The reason you're in school is to get a degree. Yes, playing cards and all that. That's mental sour behavior. Mental sour behavior. <laughs> Let, let me let me let me tell you let me tell you something that 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 sister Gwen Rockwell and brother Naive can tell you. They used to bring me down here every year. Uh, most time I had to pay my way, but they still brought me. Uh, they used to bring me down every year to talk to the combined uh, students over at uh, Morehouse AU and all like that. And in fact, we get all these black students who say, "Oh, Dr. Wright, we crave about you. Why don't you come south and take over these schools?" You know what I used to tell them, and I say this clearly: I have a great deal of admiration for these black teachers working in these schools. I, I, you know, you think I have it bad in the mental health center. At least I know I'm dealing with people who are crazy. I mean, you know, at least I know that. You know what I mean? I just realized that, you know, I mean, I'm not a no, I don't mean that to be funny. I really don't mean that to be, but believe me, I know a lot of school students have come to me now and say, hey, we read your stuff and all, but let me tell you something. If I came to Atlanta and took over school, the first day here, I would send half the black students home. Half the black students would go home. I really, and, I, I would, and it wouldn't be hard for me to find out who I was going to send home. When I just walk through the halls and do things, I know exactly who's going home. Right then, the second day I was going to have the black faculty home. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> the third day I sent all the black administrators home. Oh. You know, uh, 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 uh. And, and then we'll be about the business of, of teaching. Because I swear, I see people, I see students doing stuff to black people, black adults I've never seen before. I'm very serious about this. Okay, let's go through it. Here's what we're going to go through. I'm going to go through with you something you might not have seen before. But every time, by being over this very large agency, we have, and by the way, we train AU students. We train students, I'm talking give them their field placement. We give uh, the internships to people from Harry. We train them. We give uh, from Howard University. A uh, train at Garfield Park. We train uh, people. But one of the things that happen invariably is that you students, or students come in and say, yeah, Bobby, uh, fraud is nothing, young, ain't had it, never had, da, da, da. And I said, fine. And they're not relevant to the black experience. I said, can you tell me why? Let me show you why. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to take something random because these are what I call mental sour programs. These are mental sour theorists. These are mental sour modalities. And invariably, what you try to do is take these and treat black people. And it never works. Remember, remember, the ultimate objective of mental health in this country is to get black folks to adjust. To adjust. Some of the sickest Black people I know, remember, I do not call people niggas. I do not call them toms. I never use that word. I never use that word, and you shouldn't. That's the first thing you should stop and just throw it out of your vocabulary. Throw it out of your vocabulary. We, are, we have a right to have sick people like everybody else. And we should begin to differentiate between what's appropriate behavior and inappropriate behavior without getting into the name calling and all like that. Now, it's to adjust, and remember, remember the definitional, I told you, remember that definitional warning I told you. Let's take a theory. Let's take a theory of uh, Maslow. All of you heard Maslow, because blacks like it, because I'm not sure where else to go from. Go. Maslow had a theory called self-actualization. Uh -huh. so, all you remember, okay, first you have to fulfill, here's the, here's the, here's the way it's the model. This is the model. Uh, first, food, water, sex. Sex here is for procreation of the species. These basic needs must be met first. This is Maslow, but you all are trained, many of you are trained, because from this came transactional analysis, came pearls, I'll go into it in a minute. Uh, the next one is safety. That's the next level, safety. 
That's the next level. The third level, the third level is self-esteem. Fourth level is love. And then self-actualization. That's the mass little model. Give or take the line. That's the mass little model. Right away, you should see clearly here. You should clearly, clearly, if you try to apply, no matter how good it sounds, this theory to the black experience or to trying to treat blacks right away, we have a problem getting food and water. Sex doesn't give you a problem yet, but women get it. No, 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 19, let me care about that. We have a problem with all three of these. Let me tell you why we have all three of these. Now remember, these are the hierarchy of needs. Maslow takes the position that in order to be a healthy, functioning individual, you must have, you must secure these needs and, uh, needs and go here. A hierarchy of needs must be met. If that is true, we ain't never been safe in this country. <laughs> if that be true, if that be true, you can see right away, and I'm not teaching you all this so that you can go up and tell your professor that. What I'm saying to you is this is the way you do analysis. But in order to do analysis, you must first know it. You cannot analyze something you don't know. And we've been in this country 400 years and know nothing about it. That's a tragedy. That's a mythic fact. That is a, that's, and I'll talk about just a little bit about it. Okay, now, then, so what, look at what else Maslow said. He said, in order, if you cannot do these things, most certainly you cannot have self-esteem. And without self-esteem, you cannot what? Love. Now, let me, let me show you here. Sex. So you for appropriation. How all of this ties in it. No, out of this, of course. Out of this, what you call sort of non-directed counseling came French pearls that all you all have up on your wall. I'm not in this world to satisfy you. You're not in this world to satisfy me. You do your thing. I do mine. And we have to crawl somewhere beautiful. You know, that same old BS that got us all doing this individual stuff. You don't tell me what to do. I don't tell you what you do. You know, and all of that. And we're the only people that engage in that type of behavior. We're the freest people in this country in that respect. We're, we're individuals. You can do anything you want to, and the black community cannot sanction you. In one sense, we're the freest people in this country. No Jew can do anything he wants to against the Jews. Right. No Irish can do anything he wants to against God. But any black can get up here and say and do anything they want to and we cannot sanction them. Take that in mind. What I'm talking about, and I'm going, I'm going like I said, we have to go. Because I know we've got a lot of questions. Uh, now, the second now becomes a problem here. Because, as you know, many of you have heard me talk about this today, but you should understand this. Today, in 1980, they grew up with the largest suicide rate in the nation of young black males, 17 to 33. Largest suicide group. The group with the largest suicide level. The group with the largest homicide rate, young black males, 17 to 33, killing themselves, killing each other. The group with the largest institutional rate, that means going into mental hospital and the prisons. Young black male, 17 to 33. Now let me tell you the significance of that. The significance of that is this. The significance of, of that, well, let me go one step up. Now when you raise the question of homosexuality, which means you're now also talking about the ratio of what? Males, black males to black females. Sex become now a problem here now. Well, even, and I'm talking about the way they use it for procreation, for procreational purposes. And if we look at some of the, if we look at some of the, uh, some of the statistics about that, which I, uh, at, at 14 and under, at age 14 and under in the black community, for every 100 black females, there are 102 black males. From 14 and under, at the age of 14 and under, for every 100 female, black females, there are 102 black males. However, from the ages 14 to 24, for every 100 black females, you have 96 males. And then from 25 to 44, for every 100 females, you have 84 black males. 84 black males. Now, when you take into account the institutional rate alone, for example, let me give you an example of that. For every 100,000 black men, for every 100,000 white men, 105 in prison, Every 100,000 white men, 105 in prison. For every 100,000 black men, 1,004 in prison. 1,004. For every 100,000 black men, yet we are less than 15% of the population. All right. Now, if you begin to look at those ratios, then you have to project during the child-bearing ages, how many 
functional black men are there for each 100 black women. And you run into some statistics that say less than 55. Less than 55. Now, given this reality, given this reality, these are the type of problems I'm saying to you that you as a student must begin to, let's, let's look at the other things again. So what they say is okay. Here's what they're saying now to us. They're saying, those of you who are making it, those of you who have PhD from the University of Chicago and the head of mental health centers, you got it made. It's a class struggle now. Class. And as we all know, which they care. See what happened in the 60s. Why we lost the battle in the 60s. Why you never hear nobody talk about the 70s. How many of you people here talk about the 70s? Nobody. Everybody the boy in the 60s. And here we are in the 80s. You know, they, 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 nobody talk because in the 70s, those whites regrouped and wiped us out. You see, here's what happened. White women saw their men in trouble. And like all female animals, anytime the male gets in trouble, the female attacks. That is a law of nature. A law of nature. If you don't believe it, we can prove it in a zoo anytime you want to. <laughs> Now, what happened, white women came out and captured our women and convinced us that white women were not as racist as white men and convinced us, or convinced our women, that they would place them above their husbands, their brothers, their lovers, their children, their sons, and we Then the white gays came out and convinced our gays it was a gay struggle <laughs> and stole our gays, you know, okay? White students came out and grabbed our black students, said it was a student struggle, and wiped out our black students. And all of a sudden, we have been wondering, well, here's a fight. You know what I mean? You know, it, it, it's not a fight. So now they're coming up with books such as, book is The Declining Significance of Race. Brother named Wilson wrote that book, who is the chairperson of the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago. That's very revealing. Because out of that same department came who came who? Black Bush was he? E. Franklin Frazier in 1939. That is the Chicago school where you show. So what, what, what Wilson is saying, this brother wrote this book, The Decline in Significance of the Race. And race is declining in significance, and now class becomes important. Of course, Wilson is the only black in the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago. That's one reality. The other reality, he has a white wife. Now, race declines every night for him. You know, and look, I mean, that's what it's all about. Now, but look, okay, so what, what, so which way do they get our brightest students? What we need to begin to develop, and that's what all these conferences should be back, and keep that in mind. The only reason I go around the country is to begin to develop a black social theory. A black social theory. <coughs> now, we, this is the problem we have. Why are we in all this problem? Because one of the things that happened to your generation that didn't happen to me, and to everybody else who's at my age, is when I was growing up, the black community rewarded those people who tried to get an education. Rewarded them. Now we are anti-intellectual, anti-educational, and completely historical. Don't pay any attention to history. So what they do to us is they're our brightest black men. Look, these are our brightest brothers and sisters. They grab through their social theories. One is what? Marxism. Marxism. That's the danger to all of our black people. That's class theory. Class. Now let's, let's talk about, let's do Marx just like we did Maslow. Well. Let's do it quickly. Marx said basically there are two classes of people. The one he calls what? The ruling class, mm -hmm. the bourgeoisie. The other he calls the what? Proletariat. Proletariat. Two classes. And the relationship to these two classes is the production of what? Means of production. This relationship. And the ruling class' sole reason to exist is for profit. Profit. And in order to make more profit, they would have to exploit this group of people. Marx went even further. He said, just by time, time alone, you don't need any intervention. Just time alone means that officers of the proletariat would have to overthrow the ruling class in order to survive. Because the more profit the ruling class wanted, the, uh, made, the more they would want, the more exploitation of the profit. But he said something else. He said that if you had people who understood the science of capital, the science of, the, what he was talking about, Marxism, 
you can then raise the contradiction. A lot of fish can raise the contradiction between them. That's the word raising the contradiction about those slogans that the Panthers use and they understand. That you can raise the contradiction between these two groups and induce revolution. <coughs> ah, but see, Marx lived in 1848. <laughs> and Marx didn't know that this proletariat here was going to see called what? Union. And guess what unions are for? Huh. <laughs> so you got two damn group of white folks fighting over profit. Okay, now, blacks are not in the ruling class or in the unions, believe it or not. The blacks are what Marx called what? The lumping proletariat. Now, the Panthers, and I'm not just picking on Panthers, many of them are my students who are opted to uh, not stay in the struggle for race and did it for class and ass. But, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 the thing about this, the thing about this here is that what even the even the Panthers start calling us what? Lumping. The Lumping Proletariat. Forget what Marx said about the Lumping Proletariat. Marx stated that the Lumping Proletariat was not a potential revolutionary force. So even Marx said that. So because they're what? They're not mean, they're not part of the means of what? Production. So if we so if you admit that we are Lumping Proletariat, you cannot say you're a Marxist. Not as a black person, unless you need my professional services. You I mean, we simply can't do that. We can, we can. I tell you, we know Naeem and I, we got this thing going. I always say, the one contradiction in the black community, and I'm very serious about this. I know stuff I sound, say sound funny. I'm very serious about it, is that we have no contradictions. That's the one contradiction. There are no contradictions in the black community. And that is because, again, the thing I'm talking about, Mental side. Let me let me move move on here. Okay, so that takes care of Mark. Okay, uh, <laughs> uh, let, let's talk let's talk about Freud just for a minute. Uh, see, see Freud. I, I think you all should study Freud. Study Freud because see Freud took the position that there were differences between black and white, and he didn't put no no type of value on it. He put the value on the Europeans. Here's what Freud says, and says it clearly. Read him clearly. He said that the white race, he was very clear about it. Very clear, the Europeans, he wrote it very clearly. And he had wrote all about Africa, that Africans seem to have a different type of personality. He said the Europeans are motivated by two genetically determined irrational drives, namely sexuality, sexuality, and aggression, which he calls the death instinct and the life instinct, and constant battle. <coughs> and Marx said, since these, things, since these are genetically determined traits, that they have two genetically determined traits, sexuality and aggression, that society had to be developed in order to set certain roots, in order to set certain type of conditions to keep these two natural drives, natural drives to whites, from spontaneous, doing what? From spontaneous, yeah, we're about to have a expressing themselves, therefore threatening the life, the, the, the uh, thre threatening the species. You wrote that clearly, and that is why, if you do, if you try to expose black folks to analysis, analysis really means that's what he meant. You have to see. It's only about four things you can do to a person in therapy. Just for those of you who want to go on, I hope you do, because this is fight for the mind. I'm just giving you. The, that's about four things you One thing you can do for black in a, in a mental health center, anywhere else, in here in this room, is that you can leave them alone. I mean, that's the first thing. And men are be better left alone. No. You know, better left, leave alone. Second thing you can do, however, is to do what? Give them support. Give them very support. Give them support in such a way because what they're doing is need certain of your professional skills to, to give them support. The third thing you can do, of course, is you can re, or you can re-educate. You can re-educate means that they're, 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 they're learning patterns. The way they address themselves to their life is, you know, is, uh, is inappropriate, and you, you re-educate. The fourth thing is possibly you might be able to do, and that's when Freudian psychology came in, psychoanalysis, is completely restructure the personality. Literally give the person a new personality. And so I'll throw Freud to the position that Europeans would have to be sent through psychoanalysis in order to try to, to contain these natural drives. Now, right away, you don't have to be no genius to understand that these are natural drives, how difficult it is. So when you see what, 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 what Hal was talking about, it's somewhat in error. This is what is so difficult. See, what you are and all of us can fail to believe 
is there some inconsistency with white people's theory and their practice? It is really not. It is really not. Now we get to your other one, that all of you. Okay, that's Freudian. You can question me in depth. That's Freudian psychology. You learn it well enough and get a PhD in, any, in almost any country, in any university in this country, if you learn it well enough. If you learn it well enough. See, the whole process of getting through universities in this country is expended effort. Expended effort. Listen, that's all. And medical school is the easiest. Everybody's raving over more houses than medical school. Do you know what a black doctor does? He's a slave. Our black doctors are some of the most dysfunctional people you want to see. They never come out of those clinics. They come into their offices every day and hear 200 women, a gynecologist. Hear 200 sisters looking at them. And believe it or not, they do not treat those, they do not treat those, those illnesses that they scream in. They treat the sister. And you can, I'm just showing you, this is another lesson. I'm, I'm, I'm off Marxist now. I mean, <laughs> I'm going in to talk to you about medicine. And next time you go to your physician, do this for me. Watch and see, don't they follow this pattern. First, they take you in a little room, and you begin to get ready, be prepped by a nurse for the doctor. And you can hear him coming. <laughs> Literally hear him coming towards you. <laughs> and the most he spends with anybody is 10 minutes, if that. And if he comes in, he's going through his business. How are you? If you knew, why the hell would you be there? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, oh, this. That and this and that, and all the time touching you and feeling you and oh yeah, you know, and writing the same prescriptions for you he wrote, wrote for the flat other side. But let me tell you what he's doing, he's treating the person, and that's very important because there's no way, if you stop to think about it, there's no way anyone, if you see one medical book, that's it, it's impossible to comprehend everything in that one book. But you see, what well, my point I'm telling you as students, don't let that deter you. If you get and can think at all, you need two things to get through medical school. Two things. You need the capacity to study and a good memory. The capacity to sit for long periods of time and read garbage and regurgitate it. That's all. That's all, that, that's all medical school. In fact, medical school to me is the easiest school. Psychology, if you really, let me tell you about psychology, I'm going to go on that you all don't know. Let me just go through some of my experience. One time I walked into a clinic so I did my training at the University of Chicago Medical School. I walked into this room, and brother sitting there, this is over 10 years ago, brother sitting there, hooked up to a machine. I mean, I hooked up from the head, like somebody from Mars, hooked up. And you know, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and, uh, and the nurse was sitting there, uh, because it was intensive care. I said, what the hell? You know, uh, well, that's why I thought I knew everything about the brain. You know, me and my hair myself. So I thought I knew everything about the brain, like many of you. Think you know everything they just know at, at 18. So, uh, you know, uh, and so, you know, and so what happened was, this was, elect this was electrical stimulation of the brain. That's how I stumbled into the electrical stimulation. Just stumbled in there. I'd been reading about it. I knew almost everything about it, but when I saw it, I didn't recognize it. That's my only point. The other thing is that, uh, I'm just showing you what psychology is not what you all think it is. It's not giving people in there. There's another guy named Osgood. You're very still not. Become very important now. Osgood did a lot of work with computers. But he came up with a theory called this, called grit. They called it grit at the Pentagon. Graduated reciprocal initiative attention reduction. What Osgood has done, for us, and it is, he's been done it a, it is, is, he's done it a long time ago, but what he has done, he decided to develop to treat countries like you do a personality, like you do an individual. That treat the entire country like you do an individual. And the Pentagon uses it. What it means is graduate reciprocal initiative. It means what they're doing with Iran right now. What they're doing with Iran right now, it follows us to know. A psychologist developed that. That was a copy. Then we have, of course, which I think is probably one of the most, one of the five most dangerous crafts in the world. That's Kim. Kim. Scammer. I don't care what Scammer wrote. <laughs> and y'all just think he's talking about him and him. <laughs> he wrote these eight words, and listen to him carefully, write them down, and look at them every morning. <laughs> on profound words. See, Skinner wrote that behavior is shaped and maintained by its consequences. Listen carefully. That's why he wrote Beyond Freedom and Dignity. 
What beyond freedom and dignity did were that will was all of these black folks are talking about they want freedom and they want dignity. If you listen to them carefully, we can give them what they want and still control them. Because it was that they would induce blacks to begin to do birth control, become sterilized by making the consequences money. Money. By saying to black people, if you do this, if you become sterilized at a certain age, we'll give you so much money. We'll give you so much money. Now, don't, don't argue that because, see, something I think, uh, again, we are, we are led to believe. We have been led to believe, and this is where the mental side, the mental side is those who got it on the wall around it. And uh, when I walk down the hall, don't identify me. Don't say, hey, Bobby, because I want these white folks to know that my name's up on that wall that y'all got around here. Uh, uh, mental side is defined as the, system, the deliberate and systematic destruction of a group's mind with the ultimate aim, the ultimate objective being the extirpation or the extermination of that group. That's mental side. This deliberate and systematic destruction of a group's mind. A group's mind. But the ultimate objective being the extermination of that group. And so if you begin to look at what Skinner and all of these, and I'm talking to you up because most of you are psychologists too, this is what psychology really means. Anytime you see things on TV, psychologists have had something to do with it in terms of advertising. Anytime you see those projections on who's going to win an election, the moment that CBS at 6 o'clock at CBS at the polls close, psychologists worked out those statistical formulas. See, uh, back in uh, 1925, um, uh, what's his name, who was uh, one of the first behaviorists, who they caught um, on, a de on the top of a desk with a student um, and, and, and fired him. Um, what's his name? He said, give me any... Give me any student, any child, and I'll make it whatever I want. Watson, who was the first bit. Watson, when they fired him from the University of Chicago, what Watson did went and started J. Walker Thompson's advertising agent, a psychologist. He became the largest in the world. You see, I'm saying to you, when you start talking about psychology, it's one thing you might hear this narrow thing here at junior college. It's another thing altogether for whites. It was a psychologist who started what is now the CIA. Only it was called then OSS in the Second World War. Before the Second World War, the United States didn't have that type of arm, that type of intelligence arm. I'm just showing you that what, 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 how much you have to learn. And don't let anybody fool you and this feel you in that is irrelevant. Because you're talking about people's minds. You're talking about influencing people. In fact, you're talking about determining their very existence. And as Harold said, I said, yes, I do say that. If you control minds, you control behind. So I don't care what people say. And so one of the problems we have, and in, in, in moving on to this, let me, let me just give you a couple other things that you should look at. Um, about this. Now, if we look, if we look at a student, or we look at a university, it becomes very clear, Atlanta University, Atlanta Junior College system here, that one of the realities is our condition. And this is where blacks sort of get confused. This is where we get confused. Our true condition. One of our true conditions is, Oppression, exploited, women are exploited, da 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 da. No, 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 no. We are what? Enslaved. 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 And the reason we're enslaved is because all of our life sustaining institutions are controlled by whites. That's slavery. That's slavery. I will guarantee you, there's nobody in this room can tell me where, the, oh, where you turn your water on at or where you turn your lights off at. I ain't talking about in your house. Because they can turn your lights off without even coming in your house. All of our life-sustaining institutions are controlled by another group. That is slavery. That is slavery. Now, I'm not telling you all, you all of this to, to depress you. You know what I mean? You know, I'm talking about because you keep hearing this type of stuff, and I, mean, I believe that we are stronger than other group people. Well, we have been led to believe that we are super people. We are not super people. We are simply just not utilizing, utilizing the appropriate method to address this problem. Most of the time, they get us because we personalize it. We personalize it because we have a, good, a white friend. Uh, what are you talking about? Whites treat me better than blacks. Why they ripped on my TV last night? <laughs> you know, uh, 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 you know uh, we equate ripping off a TV with ripping off your mother. You know, now, let me give you an example. I was just talking about it, but this might be the first time y'all have heard it, but I was at the uh, social workers convention Friday in Washington. Some of us were here, some of these students were here too. From here. And I was pointing out that on the plane, the day before that, a sister I talked to some black students in Chicago, and a student had pointed out that 
a sister stood up and said, well, you talking about these black men, black women, what about this? And told me that Kareem Jabbar had divorced his wife and is now living with this 23-year-old white girl, Kareem Jabbar. You all know Abdul Kareem Jabbar, the mad, mad militant, you know, kind of. I get Sports Illustrated, this is by Sports Illustrated, 10 pages of Jabbar and this white girl. 10 pages. And this 33-year-old man says that this young girl has taught him more than his parents, more than his teachers, more than his coaches, more than his trainers, all in the space of two nights. You didn't hear what I'm talking about? Uh, 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 uh. I mean, you know, uh, you know, what I'm suggesting here, no, no, what I'm suggesting here, that if you look at this, here's some, and I'm, I'm clearing up because I want to get into the question now. Here's the thing we want to look at that are threatening. Here's the most threatening thing, yes. How got into it about black and African. The question becomes, what is a black person? Now, we've been having some deep arguments about this over the country, deep discussions about this around the country, quietly. But one of the problems is, and this is one of the problems, see, back in the 60s, one of my students, who was Fred Hampton, used to ask me, interrupt my class all the time, because we had these free classes, and call it community university. And he used to say, right, why are we like we are? Why is history demanding too much of us? That was his famous say, Why are black folks like we are? Is history demanding? And I used to tell him, and, I, you know, and I'm going back to that now, because I've gotten too far from it. It's very simple. We are in a race war. And we are the only ones who don't know it. <laughs> Not only that we don't want to know it, we don't want to even know what race we are. Seriously, you know, don't laugh about it. We are in a race war, and we refuse to accept it. All the statistics Jenny gave you, why do blacks just happen to show up? Why do blacks just happen to show up like this I just gave you? It just happened that way. Every time you look up, every way you go all over the world, blacks on the bottom and whites on top, it just happens that way. Hell, if it were just happening by saying, look, it defies every known law of, of probability that exists. The laws of probability say that if it was not color, somewhere in this world, somewhere in this world, you'll find black folks over white. Somewhere in this world. Use your own textbook. The law of probability. Then they tell you science is objective and neutral. Then apply it to the black condition and watch how it go haywire. <laughs> go crazy. Apply that same scientific methodology that you're learning here to the black condition and explain it to me. No, 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 no. Science is not objective and it's not neutral. The way you develop science, the two of us get together and say, look, this is going to be white. Okay? This is going to be this is going to be black. You know, and if you don't accept it, I'll kill you. You know, uh, I mean, that becomes science. Uh, if you don't accept it, you get kicked out of school. Yeah. Yeah. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah. And, I, and I always tell this, forgive me, I always tell this famous one, about, I'm just throwing some things out. You see what you do is, let me tell you a trick. Here's a trick. If you really believe everything I'm saying, like many of you probably do, it's crazy. Take the position that I'm not crazy and truthful. If you really believe white people are not like I say they are, take the position that they are and prove it. That's called, by the way, the know the problems. You know, you know that's, 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 the, that's the way I'm doing things. In other words, I'm saying to you, the one way, and the danger we're finding now is that I go around the country, brothers and sisters coming up, man, I read and I heard you, and Bobby, you said this. I don't need you to tell me what I said. What do you say? Right. <laughs> we need you to begin to think. We really need you to begin to think. No one has ever asked us to think before. Think about that. Think about it. No one has ever asked us to think about anything. In fact, we have been told all that. Who told you to think? <laughs> Who asked you to think? <laughs> You see, that is a type of mental side. But anyway, I'm saying to you that, okay, if we look at it, if we begin to look at that, just that one thing about the racial, the racial question, about the fact that science, science, I always tell this about how you can influence people no matter what they see. Let me tell you how you can do it. I always tell a story about Notre Dame. It's the best example I know. Notre Dame about five years ago had five black boys playing for them. Five on the basketball team. Five playing for them. And Notre Dame was losing, and it was on TV. And as Notre Dame was losing, all of a sudden they started winning. And the, the opposing team went down the floor, shot the ball, and Notre Dame, the brother, grabbed it and started a fast break. And the announcer, who was pro-Irish, pro-Notre Dame, went crazy. 
Here come the Irish. Here come the Irish. Here come the Irish. Five black boys coming down the court. Five black boys coming down the court, and they yelling Irish. Here come the Irish. Now, your mind accepts that. Your mind don't even see any contradiction in that. Any contradiction. I always say to sister, sister always says, see, these black men are nothing because look at these, all these white girls together. But guess what? 90% of the white women in the black community, the black women brought them in there. Ooh. They're friends from the work, and they're all of that up, because you can't go to that community. <laughs> Let's stop by Pasco for a drink. <laughs> and she goes in there and wipes out Pasco. I ain't going to bring her back. Yo, you got to worry about it. Get ahead. <laughs> <laughs> See, Memphisite. Memphisite. The same thing Wilson brings out all the time. Brothers who marry white people, or sisters who marry white people, do never choose the person they marry. They never choose them. They are always chosen. Now, if you don't want to believe that, I'll prove the end of it. Any brother who disproved that, let's go to downtown Atlanta right now, pick out the white girl you want, walk up to him and say, hey, I want you. <laughs> <laughs> well, just do that. Now, any sister can walk up, she might say, help you and walk on the way. But you ain't going to walk up to no white girl and say, hey, you look nice. No, no. Always you are chosen. You are chosen. You see what I'm talking about? This match, this simple thing. You don't have to get real complex about it. See, yeah. it, 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 ain't, it is so simple. It is so simple. Now let me get to the final thing and then I'm going to give you some, some suggestions. We keep believing that somehow black people in this country are in very poor condition. Do you realize that black people in this country probably have a standard of living higher than 95% of the world's population? Do you know that? As bad as often as we are. In other words, the black gross national product is larger, is the seventh largest one in the world, in this country. That means the money all of us earn and all collectively. It's the seventh largest economy in the world. In fact, it's right behind India. India has $2 billion more than we do, $3 billion. They get 60, 62 times 59. India is two, is two, is, is three billion ahead of us, but India has 500 million people. We have 30 or less. 30 million people and a, and a gross national product of what? Of 59 billion dollars. Okay, now another lesson. Blacks keep insisting these simple things that do not stand up on any investigation. That is, that white people will do anything for money. And now all you all, y'all used to up. I already got condition of that. Whites, it's not, it's not race. They'll do anything for money because that, if it's to their advantage to do it for money, well, listen carefully. Have you ever stopped to think that white folks print money? Oh. <laughs> Did that ever cross your mind? Do you all think that dollar just grows up on your pillow? <laughs> <laughs> they print that money. They print, but not only do they print that money, there are six little white boys in London who every day says, uh, well, I think the dollar will be worth 35 cents a day. <laughs> Let's make it 69 tomorrow. Let's play hell with silver. Five eight a day and six dollars tomorrow. You all really believe silver so men are not making decisions on how much silver is worth? That's it. That's the power. To define money. Not money itself. We don't do anything for money. We don't do anything for that little money. And guess what? At one time, believe it or not, we were money. I'll give you three blacks for what? An equal land. They made us money. Even this analysis about, you know, about unemployment. Everybody said, well, the problem is unemployment. It's too many of us unemployed. Listen to me carefully. If we really, if you really want full black employment, let us get about something. See, I contend that just because you're unemployed don't mean you should be out of work. You see what I'm talking about? Just because you don't have no job, that's a lot of work for you to do. If we ever get that mentality, they'll give us jobs. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you can believe it. Do you realize how much brain power is sitting around watching as the world turns without us? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You, you know what I mean? Do you understand that all of this brain power? Do you know they allow you to sit up here and go to school? That's how arrogant they are in, in life. Look here. Look here. Look here, I mean. Look at it. Think about this for the first time. Look how arrogant they are. Right. Let us come in here together. Mm -hmm. Listen to that fool Bobby Wright. What <laughs> are you doing? So what? Do you believe? Have you ever thought about how arrogant they are? Let us come together. No, they ain't nothing gonna help. No, they ain't nothing gonna come together. And we keep having these conferences. Keep having them. 
and nothing happens, so they keep having them. When they become, I'll tell you something, I will know, and you will know, when this becomes relevant. They'll stop it. They'll stop it. This one might be stopped soon. But anyway, uh, 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 uh. now, let me, let me just finish up. Okay. Uh, I have some recommendations. I didn't get a chance to get to religion because I know I'm down in the Bible Belt. I grew up down here. This is the Bible Belt, you see. Hell spoke to it. You see, you have to make a distinction between religion and spirituality. What they have us is in religion. And it's a very fundamental question I'm asking you then. If all of us agree that white people didn't give us good food, they didn't give us good clothing, they didn't give us good houses, why did they give us such good religion? <laughs> I mean, have y'all stopped to think about that? Why did they give us such good religion? Give me the old time religion. <laughs> See, let me tell you something you might not understand. Religion, religion has ever always been counter-revolutionary. Religion has always been counter-revolutionary. In fact, if you stop to think about it, what religion does is the same thing that's supposed to do, get you to adjust to this life on earth. Because, look, in suffering, that is what? Redemption. Out of suffering, there comes redemption. So what if you don't have food in your house? So what if you don't have heat? This is just a small hotel room you're passing on through. To eternity. To eternity. Yeah, yeah. You understand? I mean, that's religion. That's why religion never leads. Never leads to revolution. Unless you have your own indigenous religion. Unless you have your own. So where they gave it to it because it pacified us. And it still does. And that is why we're the only people where every time you see somebody speaking, it's a preacher. A preacher. You never hear rabbis. You never hear priests leading no white folks. Always leading us Reverend Andrew Young. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. No, no, no. I was with King. I know. King, though, let me give you this final example of that because I know I'm down in King's hometown. And we could never get nothing going to Atlanta. Ne look, right. look, nothing could ever get going in this city. Mm -hmm. This was the hardest damn city in the world, even to make black folks wear that water struggle. Oh, uh, oh. Uh, this is what, this, and this is the end of it, we don't have time. This is the end of it. So we must realize that, I know y'all can see that, but I'm just going to do it for Political, economic, military, educational, uh, I don't know, religious. Might be enough. Okay. What we do not understand here is this is a social theory. It has to take in, in account all of these institutions. You must have a political institution, you must have an economic institution, you must have a military institution, you must have an educational institution, and you must have a religion. And the only time you can have revolution, that's right, this country's never been close to a revolution. The only time you can have revolution is that these institutions come in conflict. That's what happened in Iran. In Iran, the religious and the educational institutions came in conflict with the military and the political. That's what happened in Iran. Otherwise, it never would have been a, have been a revolution. That's another reason I tell you how dangerous education is, contrary to what you all believe, how dangerous colleges are. Every time there is a revolution, the first thing they close down are the universities. <coughs> The first thing being you close down the university. That's your most dangerous institution. People get into them and that thing. Unfortunately, we had a revolution. First thing they would open would be our black school. <laughs> See, that, that, that'd be first thing they open. Now, let me just give you this what we should be about. Now, this is sort of out of context. But I'm going to push, I'm going to push this. I'll tell you why I'm going to push this. I have two ads here. And these ads are taken from yeah, Evan. One is black and white bleaching cream. At last, you can have shade gliders, smooth and soft as skin, with safe, scientific black and white bleaching cream that is not one, not two, but now three times stronger than before. They get lighter, get three shades lighter, smoother, softer. <laughs> now, not the Nola bleaching cream, cream is double strength, light skin, even faster. Let me tell you something. Have you ever stopped to think? that you have never seen an ad that say a dark in your skin? Have you ever thought about that? Never have you seen in your life an ad that say, this skin is three times stronger, this cream is three times stronger. It darkens the skin. Not that it wouldn't be bankrupt in a week, but at least we should be able to see one. Okay, now, let me give my recommendations on what we should do. Here are my recommendations. One, first recommendation I'm making is up to the people from this point on. We must place 
the interest of our race above all other interests, yes. above all other considerations. That's the first one. In anything we do and think, we should first ask a simple question. Does it help or does it hurt race? That's number one. Place the interest of our race. Two, we should begin to sanction and punish those blacks who operate against our interests. Right. Begin to sanction them and punish them. Three, that we should sanction completely and refuse to support those blacks who marry and cohabit with whites or yeah. members of other races, yeah. all right? Now, I'm talking about we should immediately begin to boycott from this day on Diana Silverstein, who you all call Diana Ross, uh, 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 O.J. Simpson, Leslie Uggams, Bill Russell, Sidney Poitier, Harry Belfonte, and we should really put on a type of probation. I haven't worked this one out yet. People such as Diane Carroll, Lena Horne, uh, Red Fox, uh, Sammy Davis Jr. And I'm saying to you, now you all might think it's a revolutionary. This is not. This is really not. It's just that it's got to be articulated. Now y'all do with it what you want to. Four, this one's going to lose a lot of people. Okay. We should make a conscious effort to darken the race. We should begin to make a conscious effort to darken the race. By accepting skin color as a criterion of adoption, we adopt children. You're that black child, equal chance. Please. The black, you'd be surprised you go in these agencies, see all these little black kids, nobody wants. I'm not real black, no question on what they are. Nobody wants them. All right. Also, when you begin to look for a lover or mate, look, don't reject the sister or the brother because they're dog. I, you know, that's 1980, we got to be talking like this, but we have, okay? Five. Five, no black can be considered a leader or hold a leadership position who marries outside the race. That's right. No black, no black. Six, we must stop using blacks in negative terms, black in negative terms. We got to stop doing that. Stop using that and don't. We must stop using the word nigger, Tom, and all that. You know, if you look at the image of Uncle Tom, it's an old black man with gray hair. The image of Aunt Jemima is an old black woman with a bandana on her head. Our grandmothers know. That's the image they gave us of Aunt Jemima. Now, we must begin, number, number seven, we must begin to consciously expose our children to positive black images. And those of us who are professionals must begin to spend uh, some time in, in at least independent schools after school on Saturdays and Sundays with our black children. We must begin to show them positive images. <laughs> number eight, we also must have artists. We must begin to develop artists like this who have shown strong black images and things like that. One of the things that we're running into in terms of religion, and I don't care what you say, you have to believe God is white. Every picture you've ever seen of God, he's white. Unless you've been at the Institute of the Black Madonna, down at Black Madonna. And you think, you probably think, I don't tell you what you think about that, but, but everybody thinks. I remember even in our church when the fans had Jesus pictures on him. So if you get, you know, subliminal suggestions, you know, you get one, and that white Jesus just flashing in front of your face, you know, cool you get, I mean, I mean, I'm going to end by reading, reading something to you, especially to you as black students, because I really love you very much. I really do. I love you very much. And uh, I just have so much faith in you. I don't, I really do. I have so much faith in you because in you I see me. Uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and the mere fact that, you know, that I don't think that we're any different than anyone else. I just think we'll rise above our problems. This is the poem that they turned into a song. And I want you to listen to it carefully. To be young, gifted, and black. Oh, what a lovely, precious dream. To be young, gifted, and black. Open your heart to what I mean. In the whole world you know, there are million boys and girls who are young, gifted, and black. And that's a fact. You are young, gifted, and black. We must begin to tell our young. There's a world waiting for you. You will end up where the world be gone. So when you're feeling real low, there's a truth you should know. To be young, gifted, and black, that's where it at. To be young, gifted, and black, oh, how I love to know the truth. There's a world without a fact. There's a world without a fact, and I'm hunted by my youth. But my joy of today is that we all will be proud to say to be young, gifted, and black, and that's a fact. Alusha Continua, Nasima Tachinda Bablishika. Sante Sante. of Bobby Wright, The Man and His Mission, is the question and answer session which followed Dr. Wright's presentation at the Black Psychology and Mental Health Conference 
at Atlanta Junior College, April 10, 1980. The questions have been edited for clarity. However, Dr. Wright's answers are complete and unedited. How does a black person coming from an all-black environment adjust to a predominantly white situation without losing his identity and compromising his principles? Also, give an example of how black people have been miseducated and trained not to appreciate themselves. Okay, I think that the first thing we must differentiate between is, is between tactics and principles. Mm -hmm. I will, I will, I will compromise with you on tactics. Mm -hmm. If you say certain things about integration, I must go over here and work in this place because I can do something like that's black. I will not compromise on principles. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. me, okay? And we have never made a distinction between principles and 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 uh, and and and, and, uh, and tactics. And that's why when we'll see a sister say like Janet, who's working over there with all those white folks and all, we'll say, see. She's not relevant because she decided to go there and work for those white people and not realize the things she talked to you about here today. See, and that's why I don't get into Tom and all, but I don't know why Jen is over there. And I don't know what she's doing. I might not want to know because if they find out she's talking to me, she's really in trouble. You know, uh, 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 I do, I do want all of us to agree at least on the very, on the principles on which we exist. That's your first thing. The second thing you raise is the essential question. Most of our children, you see, that is where the mental side came in. They took away our history. Mm -hmm. Most people believe they are from Atlanta. The people in Chicago believe they're from Chicago. Let me give you an example, then just one. Look one example. You get five kids into a room. Italian, Jew, uh, Polish, uh, Irish, black. We don't have show and tell today. Show and tell where your people came from. This child here, Italian, where did you go? I'm, I'm Italian, my people came from Italy. Jew. I'm Jewish. I came from Israel. Already then. Are you gonna say it? I came from Israel. All right. Uh, 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 Polish. My my people are Polish. I came from Poland. Irish. My people are Ireland. I'm from Ireland. Black. Black. I'm from Atlanta. <laughs> I'm from Atlanta. I'm serious. I'm from Atlanta. That is. And we have people who are denying, you see, the only reason we accept Africa as well as we do today is because that was the only, po only positive thing that came out of roots. After NBC said it was all right, yeah. then everybody became African. Yeah. All after NBC. The day before NBC said that, nobody wanted to be African. And we still haven't integrated that, but she was talking about emotionally. Intellectually, oh yes, Dr. Wright, we are from Africa. That's absolutely true, but you must admit, we are also America. <laughs> yeah. Like, what the hell? I ain't no even, you don't even to tell me that. But also, people, let me give you an example when we say African American. Let me tell you how you get trapped in that. Tell me everything you must tell us. African American. Do you realize that blacks in Cuba are also African Americans? Do you know blacks in Brazil are also African Americans? See, Amer see, you, see, if you really want to be precise, you are African United States. That's what it is. That's what it is. See, we must begin to be precise. But we are, I'm an African American. I said, well, okay, then you're Cuban. What? What do you mean? Where do you get Cuba from? You know. Let me, let me, let me give you an example of training here. I'm going to call out four names. Charlie, and you, you be quiet. <laughs> I'm going to call out four names, and anyone who recognizes either one of these names call it. One's name is Adam A. Collins. The other name is Denise McNair. One is Carol Robertson. And the other one is Cynthia Wesley. Who knows? any one of those four names. Who knows those four names? Do you realize, one, two, three, mega nine. You realize those are the four little sisters who were killed in Birmingham? Do you know those were the only four black women killed in the civil rights movement? Do you know that's why we are trained? We don't even know our heroes? So you got John F. Kennedy's picture up on your wall and not these four girls? Your children would never hear these four little girls who were down there praying to God and got blown to bits? In Birmingham, 14 years old, one 11, the other three 14. See, if these were Jewish girls, they would still be taking a money for them. <laughs> you see, but that's what I'm saying to you, see, that they have mean names to you. But you would, I bet many of you have heard of Anne Frank. You know, that courageous little Jewish girl who hid from the Nazis four years. Good. Should we make attendance at school activities intended to raise black consciousness mandatory for black students? What about students' rights? Well, you know, no. this gets back to our sanctions. Uh, uh, Gwen knows it to be a truth. Gwen one time gave a, uh, Gwen and I think I both, all we had passes gave, and we came down, a lot of us came down by our own expense, and none of these schools were represented, uh, Mohouse, uh, Morris Brown, and all like that. 
And so I wrote all of the presidents of those schools. Uh, Gwen can attest to this. And, uh, on, and one took the liberty of writing for all of them and in fact told me to mind my own business. Um, I'm not surprised by that. What I am saying to you is, let, let me just tell you some other things that, that students too have a responsibility. Uh, of course, my concern, if I was at Atlanta Junior College and one of my students didn't show up, I didn't have to worry about that. He has rights and I have rights. And in the end, at the end of the semester, we'll find out who's right. <laughs> and I ain't got no, I ain't got no problem. I ain't got no problem with no black students. No problem, no black. I have some black students now who are, who, who are big, huge, and professional players. And they'll see me, they'll say, hey, Bobby, you know, if they didn't come out politically, I'd say, wait a minute, my dog can call me Bobby. You call me Dr. Wright. Don't ever call me Bobby. Uh, now, what I'm saying to you is that unless we begin to sanction people, and that means we've got to develop ways of sanctioning. I'm not talking about having personal vendettas. Let me just give you this about two of the schools over there. Um, I did a lecture there, again, a combined lecture, and one of the most serious problems was over at the uh, complex was that sisters insisted on bestowing their favors on Morehouse men. Um, and somehow the Clark brothers and, and all was not treated equally. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that was one of the problems they brought to me. Now I resolved that problem. You know how easy to resolve certain problems. The way I resolved the problem is first asking, how do you identify a Morehouse man? Uh, now I know a way I don't want to talk about, but I like that. How do you identify a uh, Morehouse? How do you identify a Morehouse man? I said, they, I mean, they say, well, they have all this paraphernalia, jackets and all. So my solution was for all the Clark brothers to go over and buy a jacket. I mean, your sister want to go with jackets. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, no, seriously, seriously, I'm just saying to you that it's very depressing to come down and see a complex like this one, a complex like this, and, and, and not, uh, and, and I'm going to say something else to you all you might not believe. White folks and white students work hard. Don't blame them. They work hard. Now, look, don't, look, don't, don't believe it. My famous one is that the, where I went in, I was in the research lab. We were doing the brain studies and all. And down in the basement of the, of the hospital, they had all this controlled temperature where all the research was going. In this, in this section, you would have temperature 30 degrees below. They're trying to find out its, it's effect on, on the brain and other type of organs. The next one, you got a, a room that's 90%, I mean, uh, 110 degrees. I mean, just like the desert. And they have animals in there and people. And you walk in there, and these white kids who haven't seen the sun in months, literally haven't seen the sun. Slept there in that lab, ate in that lab. They'll be in there, the girls will have their, these little short things on, there. Oh, no sex going on in that thing. Nobody didn't know no sex. I don't know, they'll be almost nude, but let me tell you something else would happen. And that's where you learn white people. You'll go over there into the dissection lab, and here, some white girl will be dissecting an uh, uh, animal and crying. Tears running down her cheek. And you know, oh, Bobby. This is Rail. Rail was my favorite one. That's the they stopped up and down that damn thing, you know. I mean, and I can just see me on there. Oh, this is Bobby. Uh, you know, uh, 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 I mean, no way I would become attached to an animal and then cut him up and do all that. They could. I'm here. I'm, look. And I said, look at those people. I'm just saying to you. I'm saying to you. I'm saying what frightens me is when I come down here and see the behavior you all are doing, right. and then I go to a white school and see the behavior they do. Now, if, we, if I went over to a white school, by the way, and gave a lecture, the place would be packed. And they would be packed just to hear this black. They would be saying, what's he going to come up with now? Yeah. You know, what is he going to say? You know, because once he comes up with something, we'll deal with it. Yeah. Not with him. We don't want to hurt him. We want him to keep talking. Yeah. See, and then, then that's what will happen. How the frustration conscious black students feel when their peers don't want to listen to the kind of ideas you discuss? What should be done in these cases? Also, speak to the role of religion in black liberation. What Harold is a victim of is something that is perfectly natural. He's young. And um, I don't mean that on a put down. Um, Harold is doing what most young people really do. Uh, and as he said, uh, as, as Brother David said, as, as he grows older, you, you will get... See, there are two people generally who don't have enough time. The too young and the too old. And, um, and Harold is... The frustration Harold sees is, because, is, is sometimes if it's not reinforced, if he, he doesn't get, get reinforced, which he does through Naeem and others and myself and all, then he'll be okay. So many brothers and sisters who get the Harold, I'm just saying it to you so that you know, you recognize it. It is a very frustrating. It's very depressing. Uh, and you, you know, Rodney, now Harold, here's a graduate student. He got to catch a plane tonight back to South Carolina, do his papers and stuff like that. Uh, and I understand that. 
The thing you always have to keep in mind is that it ain't easy. Nobody ever told us it's going to be easy. This is war. Mm -hmm. This is war. And that, and then war. And the other thing is that it's a, it's a continuation. If we can just reach two of you, believe it or not, just two, just two, two to go out ye into the world and preach the gospel. Man. Uh, yeah, now, I guess we are doing the same thing those, those people are doing, whoever you're talking about. Yes, I think that you have to push your theory. I think you have to push, you know, your belief. Uh, I think as, as, as blood and scientists, I think one thing you're going to have to get away from in terms of that's what's right and what's wrong to begin to think of what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. Uh, I, no, I know it's a problem. You see, the, see the, when you start, I keep saying, once you move into religion rather than spirituality, you're in trouble. The contradictions are too many. You're in trouble. And must remember, a point is reached in religion where it's, it becomes, you're not dealing any longer with logic, but you're dealing with faith. You're dealing with faith. And in order to deal with people's faith, sometimes that's not the way you don't confront them directly. There are other ways you have to get people. You have to get people to begin to question their own faith. And you do that indirectly. And so what I was talking about when I was talking about religion here, what I'm suggesting is here, one of the things you might be able to do here at the college is begin to learn tactics. Tactics. Not so much as saying those people are irrelevant, but how can I convince them to believe like I believe? And that becomes most important than reacting to, uh, again, I don't know if that answered you, but you just can't do it. You can't confront them and say they're wrong right away. There's no getting back. I think to the need for black theories and institutions. Okay, well, let me answer your first one here, just right here. And I'll put it in terms of, if you start to think about it, you always look at this. You see, that there's the assumption that if you're a behaviorist, you're at war with the Fordians. So you go to Atlanta University, and Atlanta University, because the professors, the chairman of the department might be a Fordian, he has people who are Fordians. And that school we got, became, we got, you know, is known as a Freudian school. Same in economics, whether you are Samuelson or whether you're this other Jew. What's this other Jew? Uh, huh? Yeah, what's his name? You know the other one. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, whether you're that. And, 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 and let me tell you, though, but the thing they have that we do not have, that's where the failure of our black is too. But you must remember, you always must remember that our black institutions were established. Well, except to perpetuate the system that established them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't ever think, don't ever go up there and hitting black folks upside the head at Morehouse. Morehouse is doing precisely what it was designed to do. And the moment it starts doing something else, it will no longer exist. It's not going to exist anyway. But my point is, white's going to take it. White's going to take it. Mm -hmm. See, right now, up at uh, Howard University, the dental school is, the, the, the majority of dental school students are white. In the Department of, of Psychology, you're talking about Department of Psychology at Howard University, Howard University, which is the only black school that gives a PhD in, in psychology. At that school are the 14 faculty, 12 are Jews, 14, 14 tenured faculty, 12 are Jews. Only two tenured faculty members at Howard University, black. And one, well, one is already retired. He's just hanging on to that. He retired 10 years ago. Now, my point is, uh, 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 the, the, independent, the independent schools, the independent schools and uh, institutions, that's our problem. See, we don't have, when well, you'll hear my theory, you hear Naeem's and everybody else, but that would not become part of your curriculum for you to debate which one is right. Let me give you a good example of it on how they catch us. You'll get everybody in here just against Jensen and Shockley and all. Jensen and Shockley are enemies of black folk. Blah, 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 blah. Then you come up with a guy named Pettigrew from Harvard who says, how dare you? How can you do that to those black folks? Why, you know black people are not genetically inferior. And we say, see, see, tell them, Pettigrew. Pettigrew said, because you know their problem is with their environment. They both are saying we're crazy. See, they both saying we're crazy. You see, both saying we're inferior. No, no, no. Both of them are saying we're inferior. But one is arguing that the reason we're inferior is because of our environment. See, if environment made you inferior, if environment caused crime, if environment caused violence, India would have the, the, the highest, highest murder rate in the world. India has one of the lowest. What, 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 what Jen talked about, the infant mortality. Black people in this country have a high infant mortality rate than Singapore. Than Singapore. And I'm not talking about blacks in the ghetto. I'm talking about black doctors, black men. I'm talking about all of us have the highest infant mortality rate in any, that, than a country like Singapore. All right? 
Now, if you rate black folks into mortality, that means children who are dying before one years of age. Mm-hmm. We got one of the highest in the world. Yet, in this country, they have the resources and the knowledge that can completely eradicate into mortality. But it's a political decision. A political decision has been made that black babies are going to die. That's a political decision. That ain't not a medical decision. Let me give you another medical thing, show you about how political all of this is in terms of why it's so difficult, what you were saying. See, up until five years ago, homosexuality was considered a pathology. A pathology. But some gay white psychiatrists and gay psychologists got together and changed the diagnosis to where now it is a, a, you know, that now the only time you are, that you are sick if you are gay is if you want to change. If gay calls you, if being gay causes you a problem, you're sick. If you have adjusted as a gay, you are healthy and individual. Not only that, in this week's time, I just picked up on the plane, this week's time, they are Time Magazine. They are now saying incest should be accepted. That this week, I'm on tape, and this week, and, 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 and check out everything I say, everything I say. In this week's Time Magazine, they are given a case that incest, incest should be acceptable. Say that because the same type of prejudices are being shown against incest that had been shown against homosexuality. The same type of, that the same illogical taboos it, and some very heavy people are doing it. See, but we always knew that's what they would get. I, we don't have time to tell you, but I'm gonna tell you something. If you want to know the whites, go all the way back to Plato, Aristotle, and you know, all those. See, they always were in, intrigued with one thing. They were always asexual people, asexual people, in that sense. The only reason they used women was for procreation. Anytime you belong to a fraternity or sorority, you are belong to a homosexual union. <laughs> now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold it. Oh, you know, you mean you all, you, you don't, look. No. The Greeks, the Greeks, the Greeks had those, if you read Plato, Plato said there's nothing in the world as pleasant and as pretty as a little plump boy. That's what those usual, those origins they talk about in Greek was men and young boys. It's stated in all that literature. And what they, the one thing they could not achieve, and that's been, that's been fascinating, that's what the whites have been fascinated with all their existence, is how the only difference between them and the gods was that the gods were what? Immortal. 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 And so I'm, I'm telling you, so all through history, Plato, Aristotle, and all have been based on that question, how do we become immoral? So now they're coming up with cloning. Right. <laughs> cloning. See where you can take the specimen of a skin of a male, insert it in a fertilized egg, and then the baby, because of now, you know where they're going now in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of genetic structure, and, and the child, except for the influences of environment, will be the exact image of the person who you took the specimen of skin from. They, have gained, they don't even need women. You will see the time when children will be born and placed in men's bellies. I will promise you that. I will promise you that. See, and we are sitting here not even aware of what's going on. Not even aware. And so when you get into genetic engineering, when you really get into genetic engineering, this is what it means and what they will do and what they're doing is, and that's why psychology becomes so important. Because what you have to do is access the mood of people. So what they did today in Time Magazine, in the first shot, they simply threw it out there. They threw it. It's already out. Now look, in order to get something going, you first must get people to accept it as they thought. No matter whether you are feasibility. No matter whether you accept it or not, not the thought. And that's what happened to another book you should read, and it shows you the thinking of man. It's harm. Let me give you a couple of books you should read. You should read Chancellor Williams. Uh, destruction of black civilization. It's on the list. Oh, it's, that was on the list. Another book you should read is Thinking the Unthinkable. Thermonuclear Warfare. Harmon Khan. KJ. Let me tell you why you should read that book. Because Thinking the Unthinkable. Thermonuclear Warfare. A guy named Harmon Khan, one of the guys who owned the, uh, who's in the RAND, that, those think tanks, wrote that. Once he wrote that book, once he wrote that book, that is when the United States and Russia began to think about dealing with thermonuclear weapons. Once it was out there. It's the same, let me end this up, it's the same with the four minute mile. No one could run the four minute mile because it was strictly with a psychological barrier. One man ran the four minute mile and within six months, people were running the four minute mile like it never existed. 
So I'm saying to you, one of the things you must do as black students and black faculty, it begins to liberate your mind. There's something about thinking. There's something about thinking that you just can't get enough of it. You know what I mean? Just take a thought and just push it to its ultimate limit. That is really something. I can't just tell you how good it is. It really is. Back to Rick, he was asking about when will we reach that point where we will share everything we have with our people. Let me tell you, the, the, the first thing again is, is back to the rugged individualistic way we are, we are trained. That's one reality. But the other reality is just because you have intellectual insight, one of the reasons we have a problem here, and most of us, is most of you in this room really believe that there's a system out here oppressing us. And that's faulty thinking. We haven't even gotten past that. So you talk to black people, yeah, but the system is against us. No. White people are against us. White, the one thing, if nothing else you get out of this, there ain't no system. It ain't nebulous. It ain't invisible. It's out there. It's a strange thing that you never hear white people talking about systems. You hear white people talking about people. We must kill them. We must keep them out. Not never. What is it? The car that came up with? Not never one. What is it? Uh, no, not even one. You know what you're talking about? Us. No, not, not even say no system. No, not even one. You know, in other words, that's one of the problems. Let me tell you how even in revolutionary times, though, and why we are brothers and sisters in, 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 uh, in uh, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is a good example of mental side. It's one of the perfect examples of mental side I know. Let me give it to you. Here we have a situation where brothers and sisters have been fighting over 15 years to free the land. The moment they get the land free, they let the same man stay head of the army who had been shooting them and killing them all those years. No white country would do that. The whites would have... Then let me give you another example. All of you fell prey to it. your men. They convinced us. They convinced us. The white press, without seeing one picture of black people dead, not one, you have never seen one picture of, of, of you gotten them dead. Not one. But they have created in mind, it your men was the most dangerous man in Africa. Yet, it your men, every picture you saw, he was walking among his people, no guns, nothing on, no soldiers. Carter can't do that. Carter can't even leave the White House. <laughs> you know, and yet, we, we, not only were we convinced, we didn't even raise a question about a black, another black country going north to fight another black country rather than south to fight South Africa. But they have de destroyed the one man, and you all forgot. Everybody forgot. What did they mean there? Let's tell you what his crime was. You, what you all forgot. Number one, he put all the whites out of his country. First time in history, that's been done. All the whites out. You know, and brought in black Americans. Brother in black America. Not only did he do that, you all forgot about how he had those white men carrying him on that shoulder. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, it was amazing that we forgot all about that. You see? Anytime you make them do what you they do, they're gonna get rid of you. And so they convinced us that any of your men was the most dangerous. What I'm saying to you, it's not enough, brother. It's not enough just to talk about the intellectual insight. There has to be a feeling. And one of the things it goes back to the car. We simply do not want to accept the fact that we are being opposed by people. Back to that race war. Once you accept that, the CIA has a sin on this building. It's not marked. The CIA building in Langley, Virginia is not marked. It does not have but one sign on it. And you always know when you're there. You know what it says? Seek ye the truth, and it shall set you free. You know that CIA building in Langley, Virginia, when you said that on that building. No sign CIA, nothing like that. Sign. We still say, Bobby, the system. There's a system doing this, but once you set the system, you can wipe out Janet because you say, see, she part of the system. She part of the system. Got to give you all those blacks who part of the system. You see, that's the mental side. Should black people be more individually oriented or collectively oriented? So the rugged individualism got to stop. What I would suggest, uh, because what will happen is you you get angry like Harold is, and you, you find say black for nothing and just walk away from the whole bit. There's enough people in this room to turn Atlanta Junior College around. The black factor. Enough people in this room. See, everybody still in this room looking at each other as individuals. You had enough people in this room today who would say, listen, uh, let's meet again next week. Mm -hmm. Same time. And we're going to simply say, what is the code of behavior for black folks at Atlanta Junior College? Mm -hmm. And we're going to enforce it. And we're going to enforce it. And I'm not, the, but not as individuals. See, you got an individual, somebody going to get killed. Mm -hmm. You see, but if sisters say, hey, man, I don't deal with that stuff. I don't deal with you with that. And brother, say, hey, uh-uh. I'm like, any time, let me tell you something very, very simple I do. Like you were talking about Jabbar, from now on, it hurts me to my heart. Any time Jabbar comes on TV, my son, who's seven years old, will cut off the TV. Jabbar is a dead man from this point on. He will no longer be supported. Any 
product that supports the Lakers game, we will not buy it in my house any longer. And I'm saying at Atlanta Junior College, there's enough professor, enough faculty and students in this room to say, say hey, we are going to have a code of behavior for junior co black junior college students. Mm -hmm. And we don't mean going down there turning over no car table, because I believe those brothers down there might be a little better than some of y'all. <laughs> uh, 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 I ain't no illusion about this stuff. But what happens is peer pressure becomes very important. And but what is happening, everybody comes in and agrees it has to be done, but only maybe you and two or three others want to do something about it. But if enough people get together, black folks get together in this room and say, look, this is the way we're going to behave. And, here's, and put the code of behavior just like you have all this other stuff on the wall. Code of behavior for black folks. Thou shalt not smoke in this building. You know, thou shalt not play cards in this building. You know, I'm talking, even in this building, there should be no card playing. Now, I don't know about student rights, because I, I'm convinced, mm -hmm. even with the liberal court you have today, if a, if, a, if a president of a school got charged because he said no card playing in this building, I do not believe a court would find a student. I'm, I'm not going to fall for that student right book. Mm -hmm. That's crap. Me, that is crap. Okay. That is good because Janet's right in front we're running into about patient rights. Let me tell you what happened to me. See, we don't have no uh, white staff. So what happened to white psychiatrists? Over at the hospital decided to file a complaint because when our patients come into the hospital, I said, here's the way I want to do. This is the way they ought to be treated. Mm -hmm. They filed a complaint. I mean, here, yeah, and they sent me and cited me to, that I was dictating to the medical people how to practice medicine. So I walk into the hearing with the, with the charges. You know this hearing will last exactly one minute. <laughs> One minute. Okay? I am charged with trying to dictate to these white folks how to practice medicine. No, I'm not. All I'm saying is if they practice it that way, they won't get paid. <laughs> now, you all want to pay them? It's no, we don't pay them. Fine. You want to pay them? Talking to the SGHW. No, we're not going to pay them. Now, if you two decide to pay them, but they still not do it with our patients, y'all got to find some other patients to do it. If I can tell a janitor how to clean the floor, I will tell a physician how to practice with black folks. Mm -hmm. Even if they're outside my institution, but if I'm paying for it, mm -hmm. if I'm paying for it, so when a patient comes and says, hey, uh, Brother Wright, what about this patient right? The patient's got rights and I got rights. Mm -hmm. Now, you exercise your rights, then I'm going to exercise my rights. I mean, I'm just serious. You know, here, they, here they got it now where you cannot, uh, I don't even want to get into it, but I'm saying back to the students. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there used to be a time, I do have to admit, there were some positive things one time about the black schools. The black schools, uh, the president of FIS was up in Chicago last week, week before last, and he made this statement. He stated, you know, what the president of FIS is trying to do is keep the schools, keep the dormitories <coughs> unisex. Mm -hmm. uh, not unisex, uh, uh, non, -co non, -non -co educational. And they were in the head about that. Do you know one sister, one student walked up to the president of FIS, a brother, you know, and told him, do you realize you are interfering with my sex life? <laughs> now he told him. Hey, do you realize you now not only would I have interfered at that moment with her sex life, I would have interfered with her whole life. Uh, I mean, I mean, walk up I mean it is, it is not uncommon now to see young sisters telling male and I'm using this deliberate, telling male professors, shut up. Shut up, shut up. See, I'm I'm just a black man who happens to be a doctor. Now, point it reached where I stopped being reasonable, <laughs> with sure. You know, and, and you just got to kick the hell out of me. I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, and then I will get some of my other students to kill you. You know, see, my point is, I mean, I just don't believe. I think as a 46-year-old black man, I'm very serious about this. As a 46-year-old black man who's trying to do right, I think you should at least give me respect. Whether you disagree with me or not, give me respect. Because I'm going to give you respect. But when you have students, and doing that, I'm saying that to you, I'm saying, the reason I'm saying that to you students is, just think about sooner or later, you're going to be a parent. You're going to be a parent. But what is happening now, we have no respect for anything. That's why I admire Gwen and, and, and Naeem and all of them for being in these black schools. I really admire that. I just can stand in there. At least, like I said, I'm in a black community which supports what we are doing. Down here, the community does not support thinking black professors. On the contrary, they penalize them. They tell us the type of behavior I see over at Morehouse in Atlanta U is criminal. The type of behavior over there is criminal. Brothers wearing dresses. Right. What the hell's going on? Dresses. Y'all, now look here. What? <laughs> you mean, I know it. I got something to laugh at y'all. What are y'all doing? Sisters wearing pants. And I don't mean just to wear, wear them. To identify them, say who they are. Now y'all look at, oh, what? See, you students ain't talking to each other. 
Y'all didn't even observe each other. How many people in here from Ohio? From Atlanta, you complex. Yeah, now you got. How many from Atlanta? And y'all don't know what's going on? Was the black students' movement in the 60s wiped out by black student leaders using drugs? Did the federal government supply drugs for black students? I told you, what happened was this. What happened was SDS. SDS captured the Panthers. Student for Democratic Society captured the Panthers. They began to begin then to talk about the free speech movement, the free school movement, you know, you could do all of that. And the white students introduced the drugs to the black students. The black students started going to all these conferences with those white students, and the white students started passing out wholesale pot and stuff. And that's where we lost our students. You remember back there? Remember, back in the 60s, the one thing we had, we didn't have problems in the 60s, were drugs. Now, they had a drug problem. What a drug problem. That's one thing you were, you know, nobody would deal with you with no drugs. But the white student came in and did that. Let me tell you how far this stuff is going, which went right by, and I'm going to talk to Naeem about it maybe sometime this evening. There, what went by week before last in Chicago is unbelievable. Here they had a situation where a man had killed 32 young boys. 32 young boys, and they found him sane. <laughs> they are, in other words, they are saying that in this society, in this society, you can kill 32 people and still remain sane. Think about that. Think the implications of that. See, you don't even have to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist. If anyone can kill 32 boys like he did, I'm not going to say they're crazy. Except, except unless you're white. Now, that's some of the okay, but I'm saying you don't see get back to your question. No, the drugs were introduced. You see, again, being a historical, that's how they took China. I don't think Boston is They China had been dealing with opium all those years. Then the, the wife came in and said, hey, wait a minute, here's the way to use opium, and took China. <laughs> and took China. See, they always use drugs. That's what's happening in Africa now. That's exactly what happened all throughout Africa. You go in there and they're dropping marijuana and, and, and drugs on, on, on them. Discuss the abuse of drugs in the black community. Yeah. But now, look, let me tell you something. Last year, Nibium and Dium right. were the most widely used drugs in the black community. You can only get it through prescriptions. Mm -hmm. Only through prescriptions. The doctors are the pushers in our community. That's right. yeah. The doctors. And now you go to student health services, oh, give me a pain pill. Oh. You know, let me tell you, I tell this all the time. People laugh about it. We have brothers and sisters call me and say, Bobby, uh, my mother just died and all. Will you give me a, a pill? I really feel depressed. Now, you both be depressed. Your mama died. What do you want to do? That's not how what the hell you talking about. She ain't like, the hell no, you ain't gonna get no pill. Uh, you know, uh, uh, your mama died. Nobody, look, nobody wants to be. Emily, nobody wants to be unhappy. Right. You know, you wake up. I say, how you doing? Oh, I feel so depressed today, Bobby. Yes. Hey, you know, I mean, every day ain't sunny. Yeah, let me, let me give it to you. You remember, you remember the song uh, uh, about uh, I, I won't be blue always? Because the sun ain't going to shine, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, my door, back door, so all the sun, who's told us all this? But we're at the point now, we don't want to feel, in one moment, give me a pill. Right. We walk around with Valium and Librum, like aspirin. Right. And I bet you, we dumped out your purses and all right now. <laughs> you got pills in them. <laughs> aspirin or something. <laughs> I'm going to end by reading, reading something to you, especially to you as black students, because I really love you very much. I really do. I love you very much. And uh, I just have so much faith in you. I, don't, I really do. I have so much faith in you because in you I see me. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the mere fact that, you know, that I don't think that we're any different than anyone else. I just think we'll rise above our problems. This is the poem and they turn it to a song. And I want you to listen to it carefully. To be young, gifted, and black. Oh, what a lovely, precious dream. To be young, gifted, and black. Open your heart to what I mean. In the whole world you know, there are million boys and girls who are young, gifted, and black. And that's a fact. You are young, gifted, and black. We must begin to tell our young. There's a world waiting for you. You'll end up where the world be gone. So when you're feeling real low, there's a truth you should know. To be young, gifted, and black, that's where it at. To be young, gifted, and black, oh, how I love to know the truth. There's a world without a fact. There's a world without a fact, and I'm hunted by my youth. But my joy of today is that we all will be proud to say to be young, gifted, and black, and that's a fact.
On Tuesday afternoon, April 6, 1982, Dr. Bobby E. Wright made his eternal passage. His passing leaves a great void in the progressive black movement around the world. While our ancestors will surely preserve the soul of this great African warrior through eternity, we must uncompromisingly preserve his great legacy of Africanity for generations to come. Dr. Bobby E. Wright will never die. Alushi continue, Nasima Tachenda Babushika. Sante Sana.